Nick Sirianni got testy yesterday when we asked by a reporter about the offensive play calling. Here's how it went. Just to clarify on the call, so um, Kellen's making, um, you know, that, that Kellen's pass, the offense that coordinator that right, makes so. Kellen's offense coordinator makes the calls. Yeah, if you're trying to stir that up. Rule him on that. Yeah, I'm the head coach. Okay, that wasn't pretty, and <laughs> that response wasn't pretty. There's a lot of things going on in here, but but that that right at the end of the day, that exchange felt off. Yep. And, and, and I don't know the history of the relationship between Sirianni and the person who's asking the question. There's probably something there. We get that he's frustrated in yeah. the moment after losing a game that they absolutely should have won. But you, interestingly, Hawk, were telling us it reminded you of life experience you have. Listen, I've, I have played through coaches, GMs getting fired, uh, regimes changing. You know when you go on WebMD and you have a symptom like, oh, my my fingernail hurts. You go in there, immediately you see, I'm going to die. Right. Right? <laughs> right. This okay. feels a lot like that. Some of the symptoms that are mounting up, you have players not trusting your strategy. You have what felt like being forced to get rid of your OC and DC. Now the most egregious one to me is you start finger pointing post game about what happened. Oh, well, that's not really me. Because now you're trying to position yourself to say, I need a case to be made for why I keep my job or somebody else loses theirs. And players, an organization, everybody in the building starts to feel that, and that's what it reeks of. I feel like you have not fully so solidified your expertise yeah, in, in this circumstances. I'm not sure that everybody knows that you played for the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, I played for the Cleveland Browns, but Miles Garrett, you don't get a Miles Garrett unless you have an Andrew Hawkins. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I played. You're welcome, Cleveland. This is a sacrifice team, for you. You know, that, that put the, the position that the, the organization is in now. But, yeah, we, Mike Patton, there were times when Mike Patton, Ray Farmer, I mean, you know, we had a, a constant turnover. Yeah. And it felt very, like, a lot of turmoil within the building, and it was it was predicated simply off of that, where it was, well, whose fault is this? Well, that 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 I think the common way that is described is we say it feels like a Game of Thrones, and sometimes mm -hmm. in Philadelphia it has it clearly there is there there's some level mm -hmm. of disconnect. You've got yeah. the general manager Howie Roseman, who people praise constantly and generally, I think, has done an excellent job, and then you've got the coach, and they, they win a Super Bowl and they change the coach. They go to another Super Bowl a year later. They're, they're firing coordinators. They're taking play calling away. I mean, stuff goes on yeah. in that organization. Yeah, and um, you know, Nick Sirianni is at the center of all of it. Uh, the exchange with the reporter, I guess obviously I'm sensitive to it being a reporter, but I wish Nick Sirianni understood that that uh, responding in that way doesn't do himself any good. Because to your point, it just now we're like, what is he? What is he ups so upset about? Like the way you guys lost, you should be questioned. You do have to explain it because your fans who were there in person or watching at home are wondering what the hell happened. Especially after this is a team that's lost seven of their last nine games, a team that. 19 months ago or whatever it was, was in the Super Bowl. And, and I, I look at Nick Sirianni, he is the common denominator through it all. They've changed coordinators. They've changed the roster. There's been lots of turnover except for him. So, Jeff, your, your life experience, you got brought into a situation, whatever it is now, two years ago, where the season was hopelessly over and they just needed someone to kind of hold it together. This is not that at no. all. Don't get right, me right, wrong. Right. But we said all along, all summer long, this is when we're going to find out Absolutely. if they have fixed their issues, right? When they have a bad loss and they had a really bad yep. one Monday night, how do they respond? Yeah, th this is going to be the question that has to be answered. They can only be answered on the field because you're saying fingers are being pointed, question marks are being raised, and they haven't shown the ability to overcome those in 10 games. So my question, my question is this. This is when you see true leadership. And this is when Sirianni, because I'll be honest with you, his personality and the way that he brings a lot of this on, right? When you, when you see these post-game interviews, the way that he is on the sideline, love it or hate it, it's, it's been him. He's kept it consistent, but that's going to bring a lot of this on. So when it does go bad, it's going to go real bad because there's not going to be a ton of support. And when you lose, all these things get magnified. He's Absolutely. the same guy who was in the Super Bowl and the quarterback was like, why are you like essentially talking trash in the right. middle of the game? Calm down. You're the head coach. Mm -hmm. right. Relax. And the thing that drove me crazy, and I don't know Nick Sirianni or his relationship with his coordinators or any of the players on the team, but you can't be the head coach in naming names. Mm -hmm. There are a few things that I believe to be number one priority for the head coach. No matter how bad the players are playing, you can rip them 
in the, uh, I mean, in the meeting afterwards. That's right. No matter how bad the yeah. coaches are coaching, you can rip them. What you can't do is go on uh, an interview and use their names because you are pointing to them. And it, mm-hmm. I assume that that wasn't Nick's intention. But I walked away from that saying, I ain't make a hit or hearing. I didn't make the call. Right. Is what it feels right. like. I, I right. can mention quickly, Nick Sirianni is, is doing a radio interview. Uh, it was started, supposed to start like 20 minutes ago in Philadelphia. Hmm. Patriots, Jets kick off that weekend tomorrow night. Yeah. What is the most important thing you're watching for in that game? Well, Greeny, now that Aaron Rodgers is talking about game managing type stuff, I want to see if this Jets offense can actually take off against this Patriots defense. And unfairly to the Patriots, we didn't expect much this year from them, but that defense, we should have known Gerard Mayo was going to have his defense ready to go. This is a Jets team that needs wins. This is definitely a big game for your gang green. Well, look, I mean, we, we grade on a curve in life. We talked about that in the first hour of the show today. We're grading the Patriots very high because we thought, yeah. boy, that team was going to be the worst team in the NFL, and they don't look like it. We're grading the Jets very low because we thought, boy, this is a Super Bowl contender, and through two weeks they certainly don't look like it. So what are you looking for tomorrow night? Yeah, I think just more uh, evolution by the Jets' offense. They yeah. seem to be putting a little bit more together. The one thing they have is two really – or two things they have is two really good running backs. Yes, but I do. also am excited about this Pats' defense. I, mm-hmm. I think it, they're fun to watch. It's going to be a good test for um, – yeah. And Aaron Rodgers talked about it. They haven't had very many drives because the other teams have kept it in the run game. Yeah. That's going to be the plan for Gerard Mayo. That's going to uh-huh. be his plan all season. That's what he's done. And he's going to give it to Stevenson. He's going to try to bludgeon you, slow it down, not allow for big play. Jets D has not been good. We got Chiefs Falcons, Jeff, in week three. What are you looking for? Can they use the last drive of the game against the Eagles to get grab that momentum and be the same? They've been pretty stagnant, honestly, offensively until that final drive. They had the one touchdown on the on the zero blitz yep. that they made a good play. Uh, the run game has been good, but I want to see Kirk Cousins take this offensive with London Pitts. Please get Pitts in, <laughs> involved in the game. It's somehow, some way, my heavens, let's make something happen. Well, I mean, I'm old enough, Hawk, to remember when Kyle Pitts was going to revolutionize the yeah. NFL. He was the oh, yeah. pick in the draft, yeah. and he was going to be the most dynamic weapon in the entire league, and obviously a funny thing has happened on the way to that. Yep. What, do you, what did you see? The stuff that they did in that two-minute drill the other night, is that sustainable? Can that carry them? I, I, I think it should be something for them to build off, because when you watch that drive on every position, now, the running backs for the Falcons played tremendous Ooh. this game. Like, but John Robinson, as well as Algier, they were, they literally paced this offense through the entirety of the game. And then on the last drive, your receivers ran the best routes that they ran yes. the entire game when it mattered most. That's something to build on. And that's how you get Kyle Pitts open. Is because now you say, okay, we have to prepare for this running game, both in the run game and out of the backfield. And then Darnell Mooney comes on strong. Yes. Drake London comes on strong. Now you get that one-on-one with Kyle Pitts. And now Kirk Cousins can incorporate him in a big way. They've still scored very few touchdowns on this season. Hawk, uh, Ravens, Cowboys in Dallas, what are you watching for? I'm watching for how Mike Zimmer will prepare for this Baltimore Ravens rushing attack. If you watch the Cowboys game against the New Orleans Saints, you realize that every single thing they tried worked. They threw it deep. They threw it short. They ran the ball inside. They ran the ball outside. That is an issue for the Dallas Cowboys. And going up against Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson, they are not going to uh, showcase anything other than running the football until you prove that you can stop it. All right. We'll see about that. So Jerry Jones yesterday was talking about this. And as only Jerry can, he said a fascinating thing. This is how he spun the disaster that was on Sunday into a positive place after they lost to the Saints. If we've got any arbitrage around our neck, is that we've been a good, good uh, to very good team during the season over the last four or five years with Mike, and we haven't done well in the playoff. So let's trade uh, some challenges during the season for doing well in the playoff, if you want to look at it that way. This doesn't call for a, a, a change in the system. It doesn't call for a change in the player as much as it does uh, take what we've learned Sunday. But we can do this, and uh, uh, we can do it with the uh, personnel that we've got out there right now. Okay, so two things. First of all, the more times I hear him say that first part, the more I love it. And that, that is so next level. So like, next level. This was actually a good thing, guys. Yeah. We, we, we were bad in the playoffs and good in the regular season, so let's switch it around and be bad in the regular season. That's next <laughs> level genius. But the second part, now, this time, I focused on the second part of that. This does not call for any changes, any personnel mm-hmm. changes. Is that right? Do they have the personnel to be able to fix 
what has been their problem in their last two games. Whether they do or don't, it doesn't really matter because there's nobody they can get. <laughs> like, there, if there were run stuffers available, they would have gotten those contracts already. So, like, he has to say that. And he has to say that the solution is in the room. Based on what I saw, it didn't feel like the solution was already in their building. The way that these guys were getting pushed around and not able to set an edge on these outside zone runs, which all the, the teams in the league, the best teams in the league, run the outside zone. You can't set the edge and you can't get knocked back. You're going to get beat. I mean, Jeff, I usually ask you to explain things like this to me. <laughs> no one needs this explained to them. But you see these white jerseys just falling backwards on every one of these plays. Yeah, your, your, your issue is that defensive linemen are getting knocked back to linebacker level, linebackers knocked back to safety level. That, that is a massive problem. Yeah. And the, pro the, the other issue is we're going we're gonna to crush Zimmer right now. But Dan Quinn was there the last time it happened. This is not a new and, and whether it was the 49ers last year, whether it was Green Bay, and now Clint Kubiak doing it with with the, the Saints, it's a very similar formula. Set them in motions, as as move out, outset them with uh, shifts and formation changes, and then allow them to go play. The problem is you don't have the dudes. Mm. The dudes in the middle of this defense have to step up. And whether it's Zimmer coaching them or Dan Quinn coaching them, at some point it has to be a personal, let's make this happen up front to allow our players to make plays. It can't just be about schemes.